For head coach Tom Landry, 1975 will be a year spent blending his remaining established veterans with a wealth of young talent like his first draft pick, defensive lineman Randy White, and a starting rookie offensive guard, Burton Lawless, a man with a name as rugged as any cowboy could have. However, the Rams have a front four which is about as lawless and tough as any around. And throughout the afternoon, a power quartet of Dreyer, Youngblood, Brooks, and Olsen pounded the Cowboy offensive wall and then hounded quarterback Roger Staubach. Staubach's pass pocket repeatedly collapsed under a fierce Ram assault. And when the Cowboys turned to their ground attack, the results fared little better. The Rams' defense played tough football throughout the afternoon, causing Tom Landry to change the pace of his multiple offense. Dallas mixed in a formation which they used at times during the preseason, as Staubach shifted seven yards deep into the shotgun formation. The purpose was to give the passer more time while spreading the defense out, and Staubach was quick to exploit the open field left by the scattered Rams. Staubach's bursts up the middle kept L.A. honest, and the shotgun formation continually flooded the Rams' secondary with wide-open targets, sometimes, though, perhaps too wide open. After thinking about the opportunity blown, rookie Scott Laidlaw bolted right back to redeem himself on a surprise run from the spread. All afternoon, the Cowboys penetrated deep into Ram territory. Yet it was several Dallas miscues which kept the game close. Though a stall back to tight end Billy Joe Dupree score was canceled on a holding penalty, Dallas later regained the touchdown and took the lead. However, of 27 plays run inside the Ram 20-yard line, the Cowboys could score only one touchdown, relying on place kicker Tony Frisch, who delivered four field goals for a winning margin made safe by a brutal performance by Dallas Doomsday Defense. In an awesome display of pure brute strength, Doomsday leveled the Ram offense and allowed only 135 yards in total offense. Rookies like Randy White, number 54, blended in quite nicely with young veterans like Harvey Banks Martin, number 79, and old vets like Jethro Pugh, number 75, to gobble up turnovers. The spirit and enthusiasm of the young infected the old as the once emotionless Cowboys jumped for joy, cheered, flapped, and laughed their way to their 11th straight season opening win. Dallas played with confidence and poise, steadily applying pressure on Ram quarterback James Harris, number 12. Turnovers that were just barely out of reach were only temporary setbacks as 13-year veteran Leroy Jordan and the rest of the Dallas defense forced four Ram fumbles and three interceptions. Eleven-year veteran Mel Renfro, number 20, collected two of the thefts and left the field displaying the new cowboy exuberance. The cowboy bench once filled with matter-of-fact expressions, now lauded every defensive move as Doomsday closed for the kill to claim an 18-7 win. With an emotional squad that averages barely three years of pro experience per man, it may be too early for the Dallas Cowboys to claim that they are number one. But if for only this week, 
Why not? The young cowboys desperately needed a few early season victories to gain their sea legs for the championship chase. Game one pitted them against the Rams, a team that was like an old dog trying to keep up with a pack of pups. And if you're chasing cars or championships, it's a good way to get run over. The crackling doomsday defense allowed Los Angeles to cross midfield just once as Dallas won an easy 18-7 victory and prompted 34-year-old Leroy Jordan to say, I felt like the headmaster at a Boy Scout jamboree. To combat inexperience, Tom Landry devised the unexpected for the unsuspecting St. Louis Cardinals in the second week. A 97-yard touchdown by rookie linebacker Thomas Henderson spurred Dallas to a 37-31 triumph. It was enough to turn a man gray, said Dallas coach Tom Landry after last Sunday's game. St. Louis coach Don Coriel must have agreed, especially when he saw what number 72, Too Tall Jones, and the new improved Dallas Doomsday Machine did to the Cardinals' high-octane offense in the first half. The new Cowboys are indeed a new and curious-looking crew. Gone are familiar figures like Calvin Hill, whose number 35 is now worn by an energetic rookie named Scott Laidlaw. The new-look offense, which once revolved around Hill and Staubach, now revolves around Staubach and a cast of lesser-known but effective players like number 89, tight end Billy Joe Dupree, and wide receiver Drew Pearson, number 88. The offensive machine is not yet at peak efficiency, but last Sunday, Roger Staubach squeezed out enough key plays to put the Cowboys ahead 7-3 to three at the half. Early in the third quarter, Staubach used first down play action and went for his other wide receiver, Golden Richards, number 83. The catch by Richards put the Cowboys in close, and then it was again time to try Drew Pearson on a route complementary to the unsuccessful post pattern he had run earlier. The wide receiver's precision reception gave Dallas an 11-point lead early in the third period. On the next series, it was time for Jim Hart to turn to his favorite wide receiver, Mercurial Mel Gray, number 85. In just two quick plays, this prolific passing combination had the Cardinals right back in the game. On the next series, number 88, motion man Drew Pearson became the middleman in a rare play involving both wide receivers. This spectacle was canceled by a penalty, but four plays later, Dallas again led by 11. It took Jim Hart just one play to get back in it. Earl Thomas, the Cardinals' other wide receiver, covered 80 yards, and St. Louis again trailed by only four at 21-17. But you'd never guess what happened on the following kickoff. Number 56 is linebacker Thomas Henderson from Langston University in Oklahoma, the Cowboys' second pick in the first round of this year's draft. No matter the size of the college, not many 220-pound linebackers run a 9-500. Henderson's touchdown was the fifth consecutive scored by the two teams in the third quarter. But Dallas appeared finally to be pulling away.
Midway in the fourth quarter, a fumbled punt gave Jim Hart another life. Jackie Smith's score brought St. Louis within a touchdown. With less than a minute to play, Jim Hart again went for his quicksilver wide receiver, Mel Gray. Last year, 11 of the Cardinals' 14 games went to the wire. This year, so far, it's two out of two. But this time, it was sudden death, and one mistake could be fatal. That one mistake came when, from the Dallas 26-yard line, Jim Hart passed down the middle to Leroy Jordan, who later explained, the ball just came to me, and Charlie Waters made a good block on the run back. I'm not a very good sprinter, you know. Jordan's return covered 38 yards, and then Roger Staubach took the Cowboys the rest of the way. Just about everybody agreed with Staubach when he stated afterwards, that was the most exciting game I've ever been in. Final score, St. Louis 31, Dallas 37. Two solid wins over championship contenders mushroomed into three in a row against the Detroit Lions. The quick strike offense came through with flying colors and rolled up 36 points. The big hip Doomsday defense ran relays into the Detroit backfield and sacked Lion quarterbacks an incredible 11 times. The blending of a hearty nucleus of veterans with a liberal sprinkling of youth produced three straight impressive victories and a climate of contagious enthusiasm that was best expressed by safety Charlie Waters. That emotional factor that the rookies bring into the game, uh, the unpredictable thing that they have, I knew that if we had that going for us, the determination, the intensity, that we can beat anybody. The youth, the mix of the youth and the age on our team is it's just been super. Our organization, they're smart. They know what they're doing. The New York Giants hadn't played in New York in two years, and amazing as it seems, all but 12 Giants were playing their first game ever in New York. The Giants adopted home for this season as Shea Stadium, where even a bottom-ranked defense has a chance to make the opposition's offense disappear. Surprisingly, the youthful giants of the Shea Stadium Dust Bowl gave Roger Staubach and the Cowboys offense their roughest day so far this season. The first touchdown of the game was set up by a screen pass from former Cowboy Craig Morton to running back Joe Dawkins, number 26. The Giants' only score came about when Craig Morton barely managed to hand the ball off to his other running back, Doug Coder, number 44. The Giants led 7-3 late in the third quarter, and it looked as though they might be able to steal a victory from the punchless Cowboys. But the New Yorkers could score no more, mainly because of a rebuilt Dallas defense that featured far-ranging defenders like rookie Randy White, number 54. Randy White is slated to replace Leroy Jordan, but as Jordan said after the game, I'm not thinking of retirement now. There's never been a closer Dallas team, a team with as much enthusiasm. I think by the end of the season, we could be a great defensive team. We've got 17 sacks already this season, and today we even got Craig with a safety blitz by Cliff Harris. I don't think Craig cared for that too much. With an even blend of rookies, Super Bowl veterans, and in-betweeners, Dallas came from behind to beat the Giants 13-7. While Tom Landry's Cowboys were surprising almost everyone with their fourth consecutive victory. In Dallas, this was especially true where the undefeated Cowboys were expected to romp over Coach Bart Starr's winless Packers.
From the outset, it was defense that initiated the telling blows. This hit on Drew Pearson gave the Packers the ball in an early 3-0 lead. But then Roger Staubach went to number 44, Robert Newhouse, and the Cowboys seemed to have hit their stride. Staubach alternated run and pass beautifully and kept Green Bay off balance with his Pearsons. Number 88, Drew, and number 26, Preston. Preston's run to the one paved the way for a tough flying score by Newhouse, and Dallas led 7-3. But then the Green Bay defense began to intimidate with nimble heads-up play by men like cornerback Perry Smith, number 45. With defense providing the breaks, John Hadle was more than glad to take advantage of them. He hit tight end Rich McGeorge with seven passes for the day. This one setting up Willard Harrell's 26-yard scamper to the end zone and a 9-6 Green Bay lead. This celebration came midway through the third period, and the Packers sensed that perhaps their great moment had arrived. But there were still more dues to pay at the hands of Doomsday, and Willard Harrell was to be the payee. Leroy Jordan's fumble recovery led to another Dallas touchdown, and the Cowboys led 14-9. In their effort to stave off their fifth loss in a row, the Packer efforts became Herculean. Steve Odom's 73-yard kick return put the pack on Sweet Street. But once again, Doomsday reared its crafty countenance. And once again, it was Leroy Jordan, number 55, who dashed Green Bay's hopes for an upset. Even though the Packers did recover Leroy's fumble, they couldn't move the ball. And with a little over two minutes to go, had to punt. And here the Cowboys made their last mistake of the day as number 83, Golden Richards, bobbled the ball away and the pack swarmed over it. The coup de grace followed swiftly. Hadel to Rich McGeorge sealed the biggest upset of last Sunday, 19-17. What better way for Bart Starr to get his first coaching victory than to beat the undefeated Dallas Cowboys, a team he battled in some very important and great games when he was a player himself. I think the veterans uh, have their own enthusiasm. I think that's one of my assets as far as, uh, you know, I really like to cheerlead. I like to cheer these guys on because I like to see people do things well. As I know Mel Fren Renfro and myself, we are, we're playing a lot better. We uh, really worked out hard in the offseason this past year and uh, got ready to play. So I think it's uh, apparent that the, the older guys uh, are playing well and the rookies are playing well too. 
Last Sunday in Philadelphia's Veterans Stadium, the young and the old had to summon all their grit and spirit to survive an inspired challenge from the underdog Eagles. Looming over this bruising spectacle was the poised figure of Roger Staubach, number 12, who completed 27 of 49 passes. But it all boiled down to two crucial completions to Drew Pearson, number 88. This one for a touchdown, which tied the game at 17 apiece with a minute to play. And this one, a desperate pass with 10 seconds remaining that put the Cowboys in field goal range. As Staubach would explain after the game, the most remarkable thing about the pass to Pearson was not so much the catch itself, but Pearson's ability to escape the Eagles and get out of bounds to stop the clock. With three seconds left in the game, an Austrian soccer kicker named Tony Frisch kicked a 42-yard field goal that gave the Cowboys their fifth victory and sent the Eagles down to their fifth defeat. there to Drew, you know, was, we didn't have any trouble with an interception or anything, I just, we just, they got the ball, the game was, game was over anyway, so I just uh, fired it out there and Drew made a heck of a play, you know, got out of bounds, which is a big thing, and uh, it was kind of, he was just a, he wasn't the main receiver on the play, I just, I just told him to get down there deep and run a deep comeback, and hopefully he could get behind Logan, but really he didn't, he just made a good catch on it. Roger, why so many passes? 49, Dallas Becker. 49 passes, is that right? Yeah. You still don't believe it, huh? That's more than I threw in my whole senior year in high school. I threw, <laughs> I threw 45 passes in 10 games in high school. I was strictly a running back. 45 times. I threw 40. I remember my senior year in high school, I threw about 45 passes. We averaged about four passes a game. Well, I'll tell you, that's a good one to win. I tell you, I had my ups and downs today. More downs than ups. Traditionally, one of the NFL's best games can be seen in Washington's RFK Stadium when the Dallas Cowboys square off against the Washington Redskins. The heart of this bitter rivalry stand two coaches with totally different coaching philosophies. Redskin head coach George Allen takes the emotional approach. His teams attack with simple, methodical precision and feature players long on NFL experience. By contrast, Cowboy head coach Tom Landry is a man not lent to outbursts of enthusiasm. His teams dazzle with the most complicated offense in the NFL and thus far a splendid blend of youth and able veterans has produced a solid contender for Tom Landry. Last Sunday, Drew Pearson's touchdown handed Dallas a 14-3 advantage while still in the second quarter. Then Doomsday took over and began putting the heat on Redskin Field General Billy Kilmer. Pressure by the Dallas Team D would force four first-half Redskin turnovers. Yet, despite the harassment, Kilmer stood tall in the pocket and closed the Cowboy advantage with one sudden shot. Number 46, Frank Grant, outraced the entire Dallas secondary with one Kilmer strike. Then in the third period, Washington tied the game at 17, with a Kilmer to Charlie Taylor touchdown connection. <music> Having
Having seen his club blow a comfortable lead, Tom Landry was, as usual, calm, for he knew his team had the ability to produce that one big effort good teams seem to produce to win. Then, in the middle of the fourth period, that play came. Safety Cliff Harris returned Kilmer's pass for his first touchdown ever as a pro. And suddenly the Cowboys were leading 24 to 17 with barely five minutes remaining. Yet as he had done all evening long, Billy Kilmer pressed the Redskin offense to the attack, easing through the Dallas defense with some steady passing. Tight end Jerry Smith scored from seven yards out and the Redskins tied it at 24 apiece. Sudden death now loomed on the horizon as the Redskins celebrated the comeback. But the party nearly ended as Dallas struck back quickly and from the shotgun formation moved into Redskin territory with a little passing luck. The Cowboys' good fortune finally ran out, however, as a missed field goal would leave the contest to be decided in sudden death overtime. Winning possession of the ball, Dallas quickly penetrated Redskin territory before a George Allen team trademark turned the momentum back to the Skins. Safety man Ken Houston's interception ignited the 55,000-plus Washington contingent into a frenzy as the end now seemed near. A Cowboy personal foul then pushed the Redskins to the Dallas 35, where Billy Kilmer maneuvered them the rest of the way. Mixing passes where necessary with bits and pieces of a ground game, Washington drove to the Dallas one-yard line where Billy Kilmer climaxed a brilliant game with a leap over center that earned Washington the victory 30-24. The world doesn't stop when you lose, said Tom Landry. You've got to look ahead to become stronger. And looking ahead six weeks presents another matchup between Tom Landry and George Allen, with the winner getting a shot at the NFC Eastern title. Savior of the Redskins, but even more unusual was the fact that they gave the ball away four times in the first half alone. Mark Washington's interception on a pass again intended for Grant sparked the Dallas offense, and for the first time in the game, Roger Staubach began to move the Cowboys. Drew Pearson picked up 21 yards, and the Cowboys' other wide receiver, Golden Richards, made a great juggling catch on the sideline. But officials ruled that Richards did not have possession while inbounds. Facing a third and four, Staubach elected to pass for it. Turnover, but there were lots more coming. First, Mike Thomas fumbled when met by omnipresent Mark Washington. And Dallas recovered on the Washington 18. Two runs brought up a third and four. And on the first play of the second quarter, and in a passing situation, Staubach went back into Dallas shotgun formation. This formation gives him more time to pick out a receiver since he's watching their patterns from the snap rather than dropping back with his back to them. What Staubach picked out was Preston Pearson for the touchdown. Pearson picked up from the Steelers has been a pleasant surprise to the Dallas offense this season and his touchdown put Dallas ahead 7-3.
On Washington's next series, they again turned the ball over when Kilmer overthrew Mike Thomas and Cliff Harris intercepted and carried to the Dallas 32. For the third consecutive series, Washington had given the ball away, and for the second straight time, the turnover would lead to a Dallas touchdown. Good running by Robert Newhouse, plus a piling on penalty on Brad Dusick, brought Dallas in close, and again on a third down, Staubach threw for it. This time from the conventional pro set, finding the Cowboys' other Pearson, Drew, who had inside position on Pat Fisher. Pearson's fumble came clearly after the score, as the replay will show. The touchdown put Dallas ahead 14 to three. They were beating the Redskins at their own game, creating turnovers and taking advantage of them. On Dallas' next possession, they trotted out the old wide receiver reverse pass, but Golden Richards was unable to spot a receiver. After Mike Bass went over the top of him, Richards reversed again, and thanks to his speed, was able to gain 11 yards on a play that might have been a big loss. Staubach then used Richards in the usual manner, and the wide receiver from the University of Hawaii gained 12 more yards on a perfect sideline pass. Then from the 16, Staubach tried to sneak Preston Pearson in again, but Brad Dusick just managed to break up the play. Dallas was forced to settle for a field goal to lead 17 to 10 then got a chance to add to their lead. Mike Thomas fumbled when swiped at by Harvey Martin and Too Tall Jones recovered. Jones was ruled down on the Washington 46, but he had claimed the fourth turnover of the first half committed by the Washington offense. With less than two minutes left, Dallas went to the shotgun again and got 24 yards closer on a great catch by Gene Fugit. quarter, a pass intended to Smith, ended up in the arms of Leroy Jordan, and the Washington threat was ended. Cliff Harris' 27-yard interception return of Kilmer's pass put Dallas in front once again by seven, with only five minutes remaining in this game so vital to the standings in the NFC East. All that was left was to stop Kilmer. Lay Kilmer dumped the football to Jerry Smith for the touchdown that tied up the ball game. Many felt that Washington would be hurting this season without Jurgensen ready to come off the bench and provide his superb touch to the air attack. Sonny's retirement plus the virtual loss of Larry Brown could have been the kiss of death. But Washington has come up with rookie Mike Thomas to replace Brown. And Kilmer's passing has made the Skins second only to Dallas in the conference. With Smith, Taylor, Jefferson and now Frank Grant at the ends, the Washington reception through the airwaves is coming in clear and strong. With under two minutes to play, Washington and Dallas were even up at 24-20. Staubach and the Cowboys from the shotgun came out throwing. And for the first time in the second half, the Dodger hit with consistency as he connected on four straight passes that brought the ball to the Washington 21. One of the four passes was most unusual. Despite the shotgun formation, Staubach was under a heavy rush, and his pass bounced off cowboy Ralph Neely's helmet to Charlie Young for a five-yard completion. Neely was probably the only one in the stadium at the time to realize the play was illegal.
Nevertheless, Dallas now had a shot at kicking a game-winning field goal for the second week in a row. The week before, Tony Frisch had beaten the Eagles with no time left. Aware of this, George Allen called a timeout to give Frisch ample opportunity to think about the importance of his 38-yard attempt. The 30-year-old Austrian's reaction tells the story as his failure sent this tie ball game into sudden death overtime. For not wishing to risk a handoff, called his own number and went up and over for the game-winning score. It was Kilmer's first sneak in three years. Gentlemen, you saw a classic football game today, George Allen said in the locker room. You saw a team and a quarterback with real character. Allen's comments are accurate, but they apply to both teams on the field today. Or it takes two to make a great rivalry, and that is what the Washington-Dallas matchups have become. Luckily for football fans, there's only six more weeks until the sequel in Dallas. with a big hole, he drops the football. Dallas recovers, Eddie Podolak. All right, it's early in the game and Kansas City has had the big mistake already that they especially didn't want to get. Now they're 26 Pearson, 44 Newhouse. Sawback with a deep drop and looking. Goes out complete to Robert Newhouse. Oh. Newhouse running into Kansas City Chiefs after a gain of five. The Doug Dennison, number 21, is now a setback. Here he comes. Good blocking, big hole, and look out. Reardon is the last man that can stop Dennison. He trips him up. Dennison down to the 10-yard line. Great blocking by the offensive line of the Cowboys. They have. They first, widen them off. First down, the ball just short of the 10-yard line. Justin <laughs> Pearson and... Struggling down to the one-yard line. Willie Lanier being dragged by Pearson. A fumble by Podolak. They return the fumble at the one-yard line of Kansas City. Pass goes to Gene Dugan. Kansas City out in front three to nothing. Dennison with the call in a big hole. He has the first down up to the 47-yard line. Doug Dennison upset there by Kerry Reardon. You just saw. Third down and three. The ball inside the 46-yard line of Kansas City. Sawback firing complete to Drew Pearson. Nifty uh -huh. footwork on the part of the six foot, 180 pounder out of Tulsa. Inside handoff to Newhouse. Gets away from a couple of tacklers. Cuts back. Good go all the way. Newhouse down to the 15 yard line. Emma Thomas finally takes him out of bounds. Oh, how the fans have been waiting for that. And look at them all look up at our booth. 21, he adjusts into the eye. Newhouse, the call again, a big hole, upended hard. Thank heavens he didn't fumble, they would have booed him. Jim Kearney, <laughs> upending Robert Newhouse. Nine yard line of the Kansas City Chiefs. Staubach, a lot of time, but no place to put the ball. And now he may run it in, all the way in. Roger Staubach. Touchdown Dallas, and Roger Staubach is hurt. Mike Sensabaugh hit him right at the goal line. We'll be back at Texas Stadium in a moment. Thomas at the one, bouncing all over the lot. And there is a chicken fight to come up with the football, and it appears that Dallas has made the recovery. Five men in the pattern. Staubach scrambling again. Gets it off to Fugit. Catches the ball just about at the line of scrimmage. See that little Kerry Reardon go at him? No question, Tony Fritz didn't even look at it. He knew he had it. The Cowboys extend their lead over the Chiefs to 10 to 3. Cowboys, first and 10, their own 26. Staubach over the middle. And Staubach firing complete this time. Gene Fugit holds on. Inside eight minutes. Clock ticking at 725. Remaining in the first half is tied up at 10. Staubach over the middle again. This time he goes to Golden Richards, and Richards has another first down. He's at the 38-yard line of Kansas City, and Staubach on target. 
They're first and ten is at the 38 of Kansas City. Preston Pearson in motion. The toss goes to Newhouse. Newhouse gets another Dallas first down. Inside the 20, they'll mark it just short of the 19. And Mike Tensabaugh made the save for Kansas City. I've just kept out of sight. On second down at 15. Newhouse on the draw, big hole. Look out. Newhouse gets it back to the 15-yard line. It'll be third down and six, a gain of 10. The ball up to 15. The score is tied at 10. Play action fake by Staubach. Going for Golden Richards, and he won it. Oh, beautiful catch. Oh, Staubach. Golden. Staubach never saw it. He was buried by Tom Keating as Golden Richards one-handed the ball in the end zone, bobbling in the air. Let me tell you. Came down with it. They would be starters. They're injured. They're not in there tonight. On second down and eight. Staubach with good protection, but no open receivers. Keating misses, and Staubach has the first down. Scampering out over the 35 to the 37. Pearson with the call again. And Pearson, close to the 45. It'll be third down and two. 45. Pearson gets the call, gets a tremendous block from Rayfield Wright. And I believe he has the first down. But you saw that big number 70, 47 yard line. Dallas moving. Pearson again. Pearson inside Kansas City territory. Gets six, and the booze are starting to roll out of the 65,000. Oh, they, they thought it was a late hit, Frank, but I, I don't think so. I don't question that. He was for the ball at the 47 of Kansas City. Play action fake. Star back. What's Golden oh, Richards? He's wide right open. Golden Richards with his second touchdown of the night. A 47 yard strike from Roger Strawback. Golden Richards, who earlier stunned the stadium with a one-handed touchdown catch. Harry Redden was supposed to be covering him, Frank. Car Pearson, 26, Newhouse, 44 of the setbacks. The old option play, and obviously Strawback, not too familiar with it, a flag goes down. Uh, that's something, Frank, I don't understand. I don't know no, why they try to run option yeah. plays. They don't do that much in practice. Got up and went back to the turf. He appears to be injured. He's holding his left, left knee. knee for Kansas City, replacing the injured Curry Reardon. Pearson looking for the cutback and finding it and moving into Kansas City territory, close to a first down. Looking away here in the third quarter. Seesaw game, saw back, looking over the middle and Gene Dugan holds on. Cowboy first down at the 26-yard line of Kansas City. With linebackers underneath. Defensive backs deep. Staubach. There comes out. the linebacker. And there's the blitz. And look at the screen all the way across the field. The flag is down. Flag is down as Laidlaw gets down to the one-yard line. But a flag is down. And Roger Staubach was down. Racked. He threw the ball all the way across the field. First and goal, the Cowboys inside the one. Staubach does it himself. He really did. He, he made that whole drive work. Beautiful piece of quarterbacking by Roger Staubach on the entire drive. And Big Billy Masters, 84. Just let him have it. Podolak. What a play. What a play that kid is. I love it. You talk about getting the most out of yourself, even more than you've got to give. Podolak exemplifies that. John follows the ball. Willie Lanier with the interception. Look at Willie gone. And Willie's running out the clock. Lane Nye made the stop. A tremendous victory for that man, Paul Wiggins. In his rookie year as a head coach. What a job he did, Giff. Once again, the final score, Kansas City 31, Dallas. Kansas City 34, Dallas 31. This is Frank Gifford, along with Howard Cosell and Alex Karras, saying so long from Texas Stadium in Dallas, Texas. Even without Harvey Martin, their most devastating rusher, the doomsday defense ravages quarterbacks like rolling thunder.
Martin's replacement is number 54, Randy White, a rookie who never lets moves interfere with pure speed. Balancing White inside is Larry Cole, number 63, a less storied player who usually handles the grunt work for the more celebrated ends and linebackers. Historically, the Cowboys are always near the top in quarterback sacks, but ironically, their pass defense is always one of the most porous. Even in their championship years, the home run play and freak completion has worn out a Dallas secondary which seems composed of four safeties and no cornerbacks. Of late, this glaring weakness has been exposed with increasing frequency. And against New England, the secondary almost turned a laugher into a loss as Jim Plunkett riddled them with ridiculous ease. New England receivers operated in almost splendid isolation as the Dallas deep defense appeared locked in a mystic trance. While Dallas may yet rue this chink in their defensive armor, the lapses have more than been made up for by Tom Landry's mechanized scoring machine, which outpointed the Patriots 34-31. The Cowboys' offense is number one in the NFC thanks to Roger Staubach and a shotgun attack that sprays out a ton of points. Staubach's prime weapon is number 88, Drew Pearson, whose facility for cracking zone defenses has netted him a whopping 19 yards per catch and six touchdowns. This season, Staubach has displayed a much stronger arm and a firmer command of Landry's complex offense. But like the Buffalo Bills, who cannot put up points as fast as their defense allows them, the Cowboys' pinball offense may just go tilt by week 14. The Dallas Cowboy offense is the NFC's best and most complex system. And with the renovation of the shotgun offense, Dallas and Field General Roger Staubach have added yet another means by which to bewilder opponents. But more than just confusing, the shotgun has certain advantages. The biggest advantage of the shotgun is, is uh, getting back deep in a shorter period of time and the ability to see defenses for a longer period of time. Uh, you, take, you put more burden on the rush. You're, you're back deeper. And the other thing is for a quarterback, as far as myself, more mobility. I can move around more because uh, I'm back there quicker. Last Sunday, however, Staubach's mobility from the shotgun offense was to be negated by the Philadelphia Eagles, who drew a beat on the well-known scrambler. But while the Eagles repeatedly pressured Staubach, shorter throws would exploit the eager rush, as well-timed screens ripped Philadelphia for big gainers. Dallas attempted to throw only 15 times, relying almost exclusively upon a ground attack which mounted over 200 yards and three touchdowns, and wore the Eagles down 27 to 17. The Dallas offense has been better this season than most expected, averaging almost 26 points per game, while their injury-bothered defense has consistently displayed a knack for squashing quarterbacks. The Cowboys celebrated the return from injury of ace pass rusher Harvey Martin, number 79, with three sacks. 
The Eagles' only bright spot came late in the game with the emergence of second-year signal caller Mike Barilla, who directed two scoring marches in a losing cause. Barilla's comeback plans finally ended as Dallas closed for a victory that enables the Cowboys to remain close to the NFC Eastern front-running St. Louis Cardinals. Combining an excellent blend of experience and wild-eyed youth, Dallas has been better than most expected, but certainly not as surprising as a team which most thought would be finished early after an epidemic of injury. The homecoming was bittersweet because while the Honeys still loved Craig Morton, the hardcore fans still did not. For years, Morton rotted on the bench waiting for Don Meredith to retire, an occasion that prompted more rejection when Roger Staubach was piped out of the Navy and placed at the helm of the Dallas Cowboy offense. Staubach general Dallas to its only Super Bowl victory, while a fed-up Morton flirted with the WFL, then was married to the Giants by a trade. But in the Giants, Morton found a team on the mend, not a well-built unit like Dallas, whose goal is the playoffs. When New York lost to the Cowboys earlier in the season, Morton claimed he called too conservative a game, a fault he was not about to let happen again. Instead of victory with vengeance, Craig Morton crashed against the rocks of the doomsday defense. Like in their first meeting, Dallas blitzed often, a tactic not usually employed against a veteran quarterback. Morton found a permanent nest built of tartan turf as doomsday's fearsome charge resulted in three interceptions, four sacks, and a season's worth of humiliation to their old teammate. Like so many times in the past, Morton stood silently and died in the hellhole of Texas Stadium. And like the old days, it was Staubach who was cheered, and Staubach who shifted the gears of the complex cowboy machine. And like always, Staubach dashed around Texas Stadium and danced away from the comfort and safety of the pocket. The madcap scrambles grow fewer each Sunday, and the results are reflected not only in Staubach's statistics, but in the standings, which are the true measuring rod of a quarterback's work. Against New York, Roger punched holes in the Giants' paper mache defense, and his receivers ran wind sprints through airy openings in the secondary. Two touchdowns, one a classic show of brute force by tight end Gene Fugit, were enough to bury New York 14-3 and vault Dallas into a first-place tie with the St. Louis Cardinals. While Staubach and Morton battled in a blood feud like Romulus and Remus, two other quarterbacks added another chapter to their checkered careers. For George Allen's Redskins last Saturday in Dallas, it was a game of winner-take-all, and Allen's defense took the initiative with a first-quarter interception that set up the game's first touchdown. Billy Kilmer faked to his right, then came back to Washington's new hero, wide receiver Frank Grant. Grant's catch had the Redskins on top 10 to nothing after one period, but on the next series, Roger Staubach found Golden Richards, and the complexion of the game began to change. Fastest of the Cowboys, Golden Richards brought Dallas within three. And then following an uncharacteristic Redskin turnover, Roger Staubach turned a third and goal call into one of the game's most significant plays. Starbacks touchdown put Dallas ahead for the first time, but Harold McClinton's goal line blast made Starback grateful that it was almost time for the between-the-halves rest period. 
As Roger said after the game, quote, McClinton got my ribs pretty good. I felt like I'd been shot. In the second half, it was Billy Kilmer's turn to suffer. The most damaging blow was dealt by a blindside blitz from right linebacker, D.D. Lewis, number 50. It took a few seconds for everyone to realize just how damaging this play was. But a close look at Billy Kilmer told you all you had to know about the Washington Redskins season. Unlike Billy Kilmer, who was scheduled for surgery on his right shoulder, as well as his left foot, Roger Staubach returned to successfully lead his team in the second half. Staubach concluded a classic fourth quarter drive with a touchdown pass to Preston Pearson. Just after Staubach had put the Redskins further in the hole, Billy Kilmer's replacement, Randy Johnson, served up the finisher. Number 41, Charlie Waters, made it 31 to 10. And the once unemotional Cowboys celebrate a return to the playoffs, which very few had thought possible, including most of the Cowboys themselves. For Tom Landry, a season of little expectation climaxed with visions of a wild card berth. In his path stood some old enemies, the Redskins and George Allen. Well, the Redskin-Cowboy rivalry is intense because the Cowboys had this division to themselves. They had a cakewalk every year. They won it every year, eight consecutive years. So we come in and we destroy their, uh, their power. We knocked them off. And any time any club comes in and upsets your equilibrium, then uh, there's going to be a rivalry. A flat start put Dallas in a 10-0 hole until Golden Richards dug them out with a 57-yard catch and carry. The Cowboys gained a 14-10 lead when Starbuck, on a well-conceived quarterback draw, traded a brutal shot to his aching ribs for a touchdown. Last season, when Starbuck was forced out of the game, the Redskins fell victim to Clint Longley's miracle on Thanksgiving. One year later, it was the doomsday defense and Cliff Harris's helmet that drove a stake into their offense. The 31 to 10 route of Washington was capped by a final irony. Safety Charlie Waters, so often battered in Redskin victories, scored the climatic touchdown that left George Allen out of the playoff cold for the first time in five years. Nineteen seventy five was a year the Dallas Cowboys came full circle. After years of being champions, they were Cinderellas. To reach the Super Bowl, they had to win two away games. Compared to the veteran Vikings, the Cowboys were toddlers, a team who would take tentative, hesitant steps until they gained their playoff legs. Head coach Tom Landry knew well that despite Minnesota's imposing record, the Northmen were not a team of supermen. His team had played the much tougher schedule, while the Vikings had played only three teams with winning records and had lost two of the games. Victory for Dallas depended on how well their doomsday defense handled number 44, Chuck Foreman, the first Viking ever to rush for 1,000 yards a man who led the NFC in receiving touchdowns and points scored.
Chuck Foreman gained just over 50 yards because number 79, Harvey Martin, closed down inside. And number 72, Ed Tutal Jones, shut down the outside and denied Foreman a channel to the sidelines. The Cowboys' defensive ends contained the flanks and funneled Tarkington inside where tackles like number 54, Randy White, simply ate him up. The most offensive play Minnesota could manage in the first half was a Neil Claybow punt. When number 43, Cliff Harris, thought better of fair catching Claybow's kick, the first break of the game occurred. Number 67 rookie tackle Pat Donovan thought the ball had caromed off Harris's leg. It did not, and his overzealous play turned into a Viking recovery and led directly to the first score of the game, a one-yard touchdown slam by Chuck Foreman. Large of Minnesota's other end, number 70, Jim Marshall, to their advantage by dumping screen passes to Preston Pearson, the Cowboys' total offense leader in 1975. Pearson was easily the most valuable acquisition Dallas made this season, and his pick-a-hole style of running and long flowing stride chewed up the Vikings' deep defense. After many fruitless attempts, the Cowboys tied the game on a simple blast by Doug Dennison, number 21. Dennison's touchdown and a later Tony Frisch field goal gave Dallas a 10-7 lead. Left on the clock, the Cowboys situation looked hopeless, but Dallas had its shotgun. The number one offense in the NFC and their magic man, wide receiver Drew Pearson, number 88. But in the clutch, the shotgun went blank when several times the seemingly simple exchange from center to quarterback went awry. Dallas was forced to bring in rookie Kyle Davis at center. And with it, fourth and 16, Roger Staubach needed a miracle. Roger got it from Drew Pearson, whose disputed catch gave Dallas a breath of life at the 50-yard line. The Vikings claim Pearson landed out of bounds when in fact he was pushed out by Nate Wright, number 43. One thing that cannot be faulted is the execution of the play. Number 70, Rayfield Wright, drove number 81, Carl Eller, all the way from Minneapolis to St. Paul. And this allowed Staubach time to locate Pearson whose concentration in the clutch is second to none. Dallas had reached midfield, but the clock was working against them. Like a cow with his cud, Bud Grant gave his chewing gum a fierce working over, as with 32 seconds remaining, Dallas faced a prevent defense geared to give ground grudgingly. From the shotgun, Staubach unleashed what he later described as a Hail Mary pass. The dial of prayer was answered by Drew Pearson, whose unbelievable catch turned sure defeat into absolute victory for the Dallas Cowboys. Pearson, the Cowboys' leading receiver, had been shut out by Minnesota all game until the last minute and 51 seconds. In the final drive, Staubach completed four passes, all of them to Drew Pearson. However, the Vikings built their championship dreams not on miracles, but on solid football and they believe that Pearson had interfered with defender Nate Wright on the play. Another look affords a unique vantage point from the end zone. Once a pass is thrown, the ball is free, and both receiver and defender have an equal right to it. In this instance, Drew Pearson seemed to want it a little bit more than number 43, Nate Wright.
Drew Pearson's heroics have almost become commonplace in Dallas. He is already indelibly etched in history by the miracle of Thanksgiving Day and his reception of Clint Longley's pass against the Redskins. For Dallas, who didn't even expect to make the playoffs, the victory was especially gratifying. But in point of fact, it was deserved also because for 60 minutes they had outplayed and out hit a Viking team that was almost a surefire choice to end up in the Super Bowl. The mantle of Cinderella team has now been passed from the Baltimore Colts to the Dallas Cowboys. However, this week against the Los Angeles Rams, the bubble may burst and Dallas may turn into pumpkins once again. But history was on their side for the Cowboys had not lost in the first round of the playoffs since 1969. In Minnesota, Tom Landry's team was on the brink of elimination, even though they had outfought and outfought the Vikings for 58 minutes. Trailing 14 to 10, 80 yards stood between Dallas and victory. Rayfield Wright drove number 81, Carl Eller, from Bloomington to Minneapolis as Starbuck desperately sought and found Drew Pearson. Pearson's catch moved the Cowboys to midfield with just 24 seconds remaining. The trusty shotgun seemed no match for the Viking zone, which denied the bomb, but could not hold back America. In one magic moment, Drew Pearson transformed defeat into victory. Roger Starbuck described it as a Hail Mary play. The controversy over Pearson's touchdown obscured the fact that Dallas clearly dominated Minnesota and deserved to win. Many chalked their victory up to luck. Surely they said the miracles would dry up against the imposing Los Angeles Rams. Larry McCutcheon limiting the all-pro running back to zero net yards on his first three carries. On the day, Dallas' rugged young defense limited McCutcheon to a scant 10 yards on 11 carries. And early on, they registered the game's first big turnover. D.D. Lewis interception in return carried to the Ram 18. The very next play, Staubach looked the Rams right, then lobbed a screen to Preston Pearson, who followed a convoy to the end zone. Green pass is an integral part of the Cowboys' multiple offense, and the Rams' hard-charging, reckless pass rush afforded Dallas the opportunity to execute their screen to perfection. Tom Dempsey experienced similar frustration. His protection holds up, and rarely does any lineman consistently contain Harvey Martin. Martin's unexpected intrusion derailed Los Angeles' march, and when Tom Dempsey hooked a 41-yard field goal attempt, the Cowboy defense maintained its shutout. While the doomsdayers stifled the Ram offense, the Dallas shotgun opened fire against the tiring and increasingly vulnerable Ram secondary. Staubach's 42-yard strike to Golden Richards cut through the Rams' veneer of invincibility. In Ram territory, Staubach turned to Preston Pearson, whose sure hands have added even more diversity to Dallas' multifaceted attack. 
Facing third and goal on the four, Staubach looked to the end zone where Golden Richards had found his own little piece of real estate. Dallas's 76-yard march made the beleaguered Ram defense look all too human. Nine plays, four and one-half minutes, and seven more points. And suddenly, the Cowboy offense had taken command of the football game. Scrimmage line, the Los Angeles attack discovered new ways to beat itself. Harold Jackson's inability to find the handle cost the Rams excellent field position. Later, the Rams' misfortune continued as yet another well-thrown Jaworski bomb arrived on target, but the target wore gloves made of lead. The Cowboy defense and Los Angeles' offensive ineptitude conspired to keep the Rams scoreless in the first half. And with Los Angeles offering so little resistance, Roger Staubach once again went to work on the vaunted Ram defense, mixing deep passes with play action and forever keeping the Rams off balance. Drew Pearson's tough 12 yards got Dallas in gear. And as is his custom, Staubach will risk the many dangers outside the pass pocket to keep a Dallas drive moving. From the 15, with a minute to play in the half, Staubach again went to Preston Pearson on a play that iced away a Dallas victory, and a play that will linger on in the memory of all who witnessed its splendid precision. Preston Pearson's phenomenal catch gave Dallas a 21 to nothing halftime bulge. Pearson's big play contributions and consistent play all season speak well of Dallas's decision to pluck him off the waiver list. The only cowboy ever to play for another NFL team, Pearson certainly has earned his royal blue star. The prehensile handed running back accounted for 79 yards and two touchdowns in the first half spurring on the Cinderella Texans to an eye-opening lead in a game that many thought the Cowboys didn't belong in. On their initial series, number 79 defensive end Harvey Martin established the tenor of play with this crushing tackle on Lawrence McCutcheon. Repeating the play clearly shows the killer instinct the Cowboys brought to the second half, as during their first series, the Rams gained but one confidence-destroying yard. Roger Staubach got the drive underway with a screen to Preston Pearson. Roger kept the Rams constantly off balance with his will to run and time and again the 33-year-old quarterback tantalized the Rams defenders. With 25 yards of his own contributed to the drive, Staubach's running threat made this seldom seen shuffle pass to Preston Pearson work. 19 yards later, number 26 Pearson had his third touchdown of the day as the Cowboys moved 28 points ahead of the shell-shocked Rams. On the following possession, quarterback Ron Jaworski came on to suffer through perhaps the most wrenching series of his career. With 28 points to overcome, the Rams and Jaworski had but one recourse to follow. And so with little threat of the run, the Dallas front four had but one objective, and that was get the quarterback. The first one to the target was number 72, Ed Jones who brought his 6'9", 260-pound frame crashing into Jaworski. 
On the next play, Jethro Pugh was the Dallas defender spinning the Rams signal caller earthward as yet another Rams series accumulated minus yardage. With a shanked punt quickly compounding their misery, the Rams capitulated three more points to Dallas as three plays later, Tony Frisch socked home a 30-yard field goal to give the Cowboys an almost unbelievable 31-to-zip lead. It wasn't Jaworski's last harassment of the series, however, as on the very next play, another cowboy in the person of number 54, Randy White, assaulted the Rams signal caller and left him senseless at his own two-yard line. With the defense delivering excellent field position, the Dallas offense was assured of points on the board. The boys' offense never reigned at surging pace, as Staubach and Preston Pearson teamed up for 27 yards in the fourth quarter. Soon afterward, Roger was adding aerial yardage to his brilliant four-touchdown passing day with a frozen rope shot to Drew Pearson. From the Rams' nine-yard line, Roger's on-the-money pass to number 81 Percy Howard was deflected at the last moment, and the Cowboys had to settle for a third Tony Frisch field goal to make the final score 37 to 7. One week later at the Coliseum, the opinions were unanimous. The Rams were bound to win. Is there any question? I mean, is there any question on who's going to win? Would I be dressed like this if there was a doubt in my mind as to who was going to win? We're going to go to the Super Bowl! Tom Landry's defensive strategy was simple. Stop Larry McCutcheon. McCutcheon, who gained 237 yards against St. Louis, was flat out crushed and held to 10 yards on 11 carries. With McCutcheon eliminated, the over-eager front four towed out and stampeded into quarterback Ron Jaworski. The question still remained whether Landry's offense could budge the NFC's number one defense. The interior line of Fitzgerald, Nye, and Lawless held firm in the middle, while Rayfield Wright drove out Jack Youngblood and Ralph Neely kicked out Fred Dreyer. The day belonged to 30-year-old Preston Pearson the former basketball player at Illinois, who once blocked a skyhook by Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. The former Steeler was the only cowboy ever to play for another NFL team, and the man Roger Starbuck called the key to our season. Pearson caught three touchdown passes and caused the fall of the Ram Empire in its own Coliseum. A day that began with shouting ended in silence as the Cowboys unhinged, then dismantled a defense that had yielded under 10 points a game during the 1975 season. This was a day of absolute victory. The defense held the Rams to seven points while the offense rolled up 37 of their own. But more than that, it was a tribute to Tom Landry and the bold strategies called Sandlot or Worse. The Dallas Cowboys laid waste to the cynics and skeptics. They were the NFC champions. They were going to the Super Bowl.
Playing in the Super Bowl is the dream of every football player. To win the Super Bowl is the ultimate triumph. To be your team's most valuable player in the Super Bowl, that's too much even to dream about. Super Sunday dawned bright and sunny. For the Dallas Cowboys, it was another day of being underdogs. After so much accomplished, they would have been forgiven for falling flat on their helmets. Instead, they played dead even with the world champion Pittsburgh Steelers and made the 10th Super Bowl the most exciting and competitive ever. Dallas displayed their signature offense, a versatile and varied attack. Unlike so many teams before them, they did not dull out this game. Their philosophy was as clear as a kid's letter from camp. Having fun, happy to be here. The defense which held Chuck Foreman and Lawrence McCutcheon to under 100 yards in the playoffs limited Franco Harris to 82 on 27 attempts. The Cowboys led for most of the game, but the Pittsburgh Steelers and graceful Lynn Swan were the better team at the end. Later, Swan said, after my touchdown, we all expected them to give up. They never did. The die-hard Cowboys battled to the final second when time and the Steelers combined to defeat them 21 to 17. Painful as it was to lose the biggest game of the season, everyone agreed there were no losers in Super Bowl X. Certainly not the Dallas Cowboys, who re-established themselves as champions and continued a streak of excellence that has produced 10 straight winning seasons and nine playoff appearances in 10 years. The best is yet to come, for this is a young team, a team with spirit and character, a team that wins with a smile. <laughs>